This is Bob Whitaker. Welcome to History Respawn. Today's episode considers Return of the Obra Dinn, the latest game from developer Lucas Pope, who also developed Papers, Please. Return of the Obra Dinn takes place on a British East India Company ship in 1807. The player takes on the role of an EIC insurance adjuster who boards the derelict Obra Dinn to discover the fate of the ship's now missing crew. The player must use a set of audio, visual, and documentary clues along with a fantastical time travel device called the Momentum Mortem to solve the ship's various mysteries. To help me explore the world of the Obra Dinn, I've invited historian Megan Walker onto the show. Megan is a doctoral student at the University of Alberta, working on the history of the British Royal Navy during the Napoleonic era. She's particularly focused on the distribution and politics of mass-produced maritime clothes, as well as the uniforms of the Royal Marines. Her MA at Memorial University in Newfoundland was on the inventories of deceased seafarers in the British Merchant Marine during the 19th century. In many ways, playing Return of the Upper Den is like exploring a video game version of Megan's research. Megan, welcome to the show. Hi, I'm so happy to be here. Oberdin is already famous for its fantastical narrative and gameplay elements, which we'll discuss at the end of the show. But the game also includes several realistic touches from the Napoleonic era. In playing this game, what did you make of the game's depiction of this era of the Age of Sail? I like fangirled out about the ship model, actually. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing I did was just like <laughs> run around. I didn't even look at the body. I just ran around the deck and like looked at things. I actually look at Mark Eisenbard Brunel in my research. So I was like squeeing about all the blocks on in the rigging, which is like a really esoteric <laughs> thing that someone would be excited about. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm that person. <laughs> Yeah, the ship looks great. I really, and I, as the ship opens up and you, you go back and you visit the ship with actual people in it, it's a really great atmosphere. You see the, one of my favorite parts is, um, is the uh, hammock and seeing how close everyone lives together and, and the sort of the lack of space and the animals being all around you and just like there. And you can, you can hear like a goat braying in the background and things and you and it just sort of gives you this yeah like these ships are really alive even though you're dealing with a dead ship at the end it's a great recreation of a vessel the other thing i was really impressed with was the actual crew complement the actual diversity of the crew i was really pleased with um seeing lascars and seeing uh chinese sailors and and polynesians and um, African Americans. Uh, it was really great. Those people were totally all over ships at this period. Um, so it was really exciting to see that acknowledged on a game. And also, I have a note mm -hmm. here that says this game would be really boring if it was just trying to figure out the identities of like 60 white guys. <laughs> it would be really hard <laughs> and really dull. Yeah, and even within the the white guys uh, in the game, there's quite yeah. a bit of diversity, right? I mean, there's Englishmen, yeah. there's Scots, uh, there's, somebody there's somebody from Wales, <laughs> there's somebody from from uh, Denmark. No, uh, is there I'm, anybody from Canada? Um, I'm, I was kind of disappointed, but I wasn't really surprised. Uh, Canadians, they did do they did do deep sea like out of Britain, but they did tend to like sailing out of um, out of Nova Scotia and out of Quebec and out of Newfoundland yeah. as their their home crews. They did a lot more specific trade. Like going down into uh, Brazil for sugar, and and because they were moving salt fish, a lot of it was salt fish. So so not strange that there aren't any Canadians on the ship. But I was really pleased to see like the the dynamic, like yeah, the Europeans, not just British uh, sailors, but Europeans and um, Russians and you know people from India and all over. Mm. Uh, yeah, and crews are really diverse, right into the right up to the First World War. And uh, they're bringing all sorts of cultural influence into London, these sailors. So this is the point where, for example, London gets its first Indian food restaurant and uh, shampoo is introduced to London. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thank, thank goodness. <laughs> so, so different ideas about cleanliness and, and food are, are being imported because of course the the people who ran the East India Company were bringing spices home and sort of modifying them with British cuisine. But so there was a huge population of, of foreign seafarers 
So uh, seafaring and naval engagements during the Napoleonic Wars are a really common backdrop for historical fiction. Uh, you know, for instance, I'm sure many viewers are familiar with uh, C.S. Forrester's Horatio Hornblower novels uh, or Patrick O'Brien's Aubrey and Martin uh, books. What do you think it is about this era of history that draws so much interest from fiction writers and now from game developers? Um, the short answer would be nostalgia. <laughs> The sea is such a, it's been a site of nostalgia for a long time. And it really starts getting going in the late 19th century, but it has a lot to do with sort of a sense that there's this old world slipping away from us that we'll never get back, which is true in some ways, but it only conveniently ignores that we continue to have ships and continue to ship products and a lot of what goes on in modern shipping is still very similar to how it used to be except the ships aren't really the same technological ships but one of the fascinating things to me about this game are the fact that they look very similar to woodcut prints so like about halfway through the game I was just like mm -hmm. oh I know what this is reminding me of it's reminding me of like woodcut prints that I would see in like retrospectives of sailor town where they would do woodcut prints and obviously this was already backwards for the 1920s instead of getting photographs of places to have these like nostalgic wood prints in books that were also nostalgic snapshots of parts of london or parts of liverpool or parts of new york that were were no longer so I like rushed out and got a, a copy of an autobiography I have that has wood cuts in it and I was actually shocked to find that I had like parts of the game and wood cuts that I could put side by side and like looked similar, like the scenes were similar even. So mm. it's it's really funny to me that this game is nostalgic for like several things, which is the one bit graphics on like old Apple computers from the eighties and also this like period of history where um, you could go to sea and everyone can die and no one would know what happened. And you have to deduce this with, you know, a magic <laughs> pocket watch. <laughs> uh, well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about the game mechanics. So, in this game, uh, you know, you uh, the kind of uh, moment by moment uh, mechanics involve using uh, the momentum mortem pocket watch to solve the game's mysteries, uh, and those relate primarily uh, to the fate of each crew member, what killed them, uh, and then who was responsible, uh, who or what was responsible for those deaths. And for me, I found this part of the game to play a bit like a historian simulator. Uh, in the sense that as a historian, as the player in the game, uh, you're coming to the scene at the end and you're using an incomplete set of audio, visual, and documentary clues in order to discover the fate of each crew member. And Megan, I know that you've had some direct experience with researching the lives and deaths of merchant seamen in the 19th century. So I'm really curious, what did you make of the deductive process in Return uh, of the Overdue? I found Oprah it Day? the same as you. Like, I found it absolutely fascinating and sort of a glimpse at how a historian works, minus some of the supernatural elements and also the actual game telling you that you got everything right, which is something we never have the luxury of in real life. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would love to have that yeah. three fate, fates <laughs> correct uh, chime oh, come man, up in the so archive that would be amazing where i'm working in right now because i'm working at sort of, i'm working in um supplying clothes to the royal navy and there's so much stuff that i'm trying to work out by deduction because because there's just so much so many gaps in it and i was just like oh man if i could just have if i could just have something like some some magical compass tell me that this was the right date <laughs> For this thing <laughs> that would be so perfect but the actual combination of the image of the crew and the crew list itself and the moments of violence in the game is actually very similar to my master's work like less to do with the photograph and more to do with the combination of a violent action and the crew list so what i was doing is i was going through this massive database of british government documents called crew agreements 
It's basically like the crew list in the game, except far more detailed. It told you things like what they were going to eat for the, the voyage, um, what their wages would be, where they were from, which is, I guess, included in the game. Their signature, so you can extrapolate ideas of literacy from whether they, they could or couldn't sign their names, um, and all sorts of fun details like that. And one thing that you had to record is whether or not the sailor lived through the voyage. So you were, so you get a logbook additionally, which is not something that's in the game, but I guess is sort of represented by the, the compass, being able to go back in time and visit a moment of, uh, of action, because generally what logbooks would record is moments of violence, like a fight or a death or something significant that the government would want to know uh, that happened on the vessel. And what I was interested in is when sailors died, they left, uh, they were obligated to have their possessions inventoried. Uh, and then those possessions would be sold to their crew members and the liquidated assets would be returned to their families unless they were in debt to the ship and then the ship got all their money. So I had one guy die of like um, disease in India. I think it was in Madras. and they buried him. So if you are buried at sea, it's just like some canvas, they sew you into canvas and they throw you overboard. But if they bury you on land, they have to pay to bury you. So all his wages went towards his burial and nothing mm. went home to his family. And it was just like this sad, <laughs> the sad story of this guy who had died so far away from home and had had a proper Christian burial, but it totally wiped out all his savings from like all his wages from the voyage. And so you get these fascinating snapshots of, of their material possessions when they died. And it's really interesting that this game sort of follows that same sort of mechanic where I was like going through a database and literally searching out deaths in order to get these records of crew possessions, which is the, one of the only ways and maybe one of the best ways that you can look at what a working man would own in the late 19th century. Mm. Uh, all right. Well, let's uh, go on to our last question. And this is a, a spoiler heavy question. So if you haven't played the game and you don't want any part of it to be ruined for you, uh, please go ahead and stop this now. Uh, but we are going to talk about some of the elements that come in uh, in the late game, in particular the fantastical elements related to the game's story. So we've already discussed the use of the pocket watch for the character to essentially time travel to uncover the mysteries of the ship. Uh, but during the course of that work, you also come across some pretty fantastical nautical terrors. Uh, and this includes uh, running into mermaids uh, and then also, uh, most spectacularly, a kraken. Um, so how did these kinds of mythical creatures fit in with the genuine concerns of sailors during this era of history? Um, you're getting in, enlightenment ideas and new understandings about the natural world over the course of the 18th century, but the sort of creation of hard sciences um, and, and other disciplines is something which happens over the course of the 19th century. So how I would imagine Seeker is understood um, sort of mythological creatures at this time would be sort of uh, an understanding that maybe some of the stuff isn't true, but also maybe it could be true. Um, because at this time, people are starting to do a lot of exploration. Uh, Cooks only just visited uh, Australia in the last 20, 30 years. 
they're visiting Hawaii, they're visiting the coast of of Western Canada and Western the Western United States, and they're seeing all sorts of things that and the Arctic uh, or the Antarctic. So they're seeing all sorts of things right now at this period that, that defy explanation, but are also causing people who would like an explanation to think about how this would function scientifically. Other things that are happening at this time would be the first stirrings of paleontology, looking at fossils in on the coast of England and thinking, where do these actually sit in the history of the world? Not in terms of a biblical world, but in terms of like a geological world. And mm -hmm. uh, I actually poked around and tried to find some actual books about this, um, not modern books, but historical books. And there's actually a great book online that's totally free um, on archive.org, I think, called Henry Lee's Sea Monsters Unmasked and Sea Fables Explained. And it is from 1883. Um, and it actually covers all, most all, the fantastical creatures in this game and has some great theories about where krakens, where the um, history of krakens comes from. And he goes through all their mythological uh, stories and things and there's actually this fascinating chapter on sea serpents where he basically theorizes that sea serpents are actually giant squid that we just see the head of the squid popping out and then all the tentacles flailing through the water <laughs> and that is the source of anyway um but because the other thing that is rising mm. right now is the as folklore is a subject of inquiry. Uh, so historic, so folklorists are going into the countryside, again, linked to nostalgia, to this idea that there is a idealized English past or Scottish past or Irish past that is slipping away and must be preserved in records. So these folklorists are going out, they're collecting old stories, they're collecting um, songs, they're collecting snapshots of ways of life. Um, people are writing books like Thomas Hardy is really famous for writing sort of nostalgic agricultural stories. And they're, they're trying to save these mm. like old fashioned ideas, but they're also trying to piece together why these beliefs originated. So, the mythological creatures in the sea would be one of those things but yeah it's, mm. it's that is i think one of the high points of the game you sort of go along thinking this is like a normal game except for obviously the time piece and then it's like giant squid <laughs> yeah well it's really it's really offsetting because you know you get through i think it's the first couple of chapters in the book or you know like it, it starts you at the end basically but you get through the first couple ones and you're like oh okay they just murdered each other for some reason and and maybe maybe there was some illness too uh there was obviously a storm you know but then then you get into the middle portion of the game and it's like oh my goodness what is going on here all right well that's going to do it for this episode of history respawn megan thank you so much for joining me oh it was my pleasure if you enjoy our work here at History Respawn and are interested in supporting us, please go to www.patreon.com forward slash History Respawn. That's all for today's episode. Until next time, goodbye.